We, this week we only had a couple of days of uh, legislative activity because of the Jewish holidays. And so we only had Monday and Tuesday activity. Um, we come back, start up on Monday. We will start right away with a continuation of the hearings on the President's plan in Iraq. Uh, many of you may have heard what the President said. Many of you may have heard what General Petraeus said in his testimony before the House and the Senate. Uh, many of you may have been left like I was, very unconvinced that there's been any change. Um, uh, my quick two cents on that is this. Uh, the President in January told us that he was going to do this so-called surge of 30,000 troops so that the Iraqis had the space they needed to establish the underpinnings politically, military, be a democratic government. So that way we, they could stand up and we could, as he said, stand down. Well, what we heard yes, day before yesterday for, from the president in essence was that we'll be able to stand down to the tune of 5,000 troops over the next six or so months. Um, that's only a fifth of the number that went as a result of the surge. There, there's talk, the general, General Petraeus is saying that perhaps, perhaps, by the end of July or August, we might be able to get the 30,000 or so troops that constituted the surge to come back home. Uh, I don't know about you, but for me, that's not enough. That, that's not progress. The 5,000 that the president talked about sending back, he has to send back whether he's telling us he's going to or not, simply because they have to, they've already done their, they've served their tour, and they can't be extended be longer without endangering their lives and our lives because they will be so fatigued. So that's just a normal rotation to get those, those soldiers home. So we're really not actually seeing any type of uh, with, uh, with return of our troops, as the President says. And to, to tell us that by the end of August of next year we may get twenty-five to 30,000 troops home, to me is nothing. It, it just says that it took the surge 18 months to leave us where we were before with a whole bunch more dead soldiers and billions more spent in the interim. And so I am going to go back to DC and be one of those who continues to ad advocate for a strict and determined withdrawal deadline uh, with benchmarks for how, we, how quickly we bring back the troops. Can we get there? Well, as you've seen in the conversations, uh, very few Republican members in the House or the Senate have talked about redeploying troops. Most are still talking about giving the President the latitude he's asking for. Without Republican participation, there, it's not possible to, to have a fixed uh, set for redeployment, date for redeployment, uh, and with uh, determined benchmarks. That's because in the Senate, while there is a 51-person uh, majority of Democrats in the Senate, uh, right now, the Senate is operating de facto with a 60 mem a vote requirement for passage of anything. And that's because the minority, the Republican minority in the Senate, has in essence imposed what's called a filibuster vote on every single activity, which requires that in order to be able to close the debate on any, any, any single item and pass it through, you must have a supermajority of 60 votes to make that happen. Well, to get 60 votes, you need at least nine Republican members. And so far, we have not found nine Senate Republicans who are willing to impose a date for withdrawal on the President's Iraq proposal. So that's going to make it very tough. Now, we are in a position of not knowing how to, how to move without Republican support, because anything we do either needs 60 votes or if the president chooses to veto, we'll need 68 votes in the Senate and 400 and, I'm sorry, 289 votes in the House. Uh, of 435 members in the House of Representatives, 218 is a simple majority, but to get two-thirds majority, you need 289. And so that's the difficulty we confront with Iraq. And the next big issue on Iraq will be the funding for Iraq. And many folks have said that's one way to shut down the operations in Iraq is to shut off the funding. Easier said than done. We can get into that if you want. Budget. Um, we are going in loggerheads with the president on the budget because the president, uh, while we have spent massively on the Defense Department, and as you know, we're spending close to $10 billion a month in Iraq today, um, we are, he, the president is calling for pretty massive cuts in education and housing. And we have said that's wrong to make poor kids uh, 
families who can't afford uh, decent housing to pay for the cost of Iraq, while we've had these tax cuts that have gone mostly to wealthy people still in the president's budget. And so what we're trying to do is figure out ways, for example, you probably heard that last week we passed legislation which will, if the president signs it, will cut in half the interest rate that students play for their college loans. Uh, we're reversing what had happened over the last five or six years where the Congress had actually allowed interest rates for student loans to go up. We're going to cut those in half. We also increased the size of Pell Grants, which is a federal uh, grant program for college students. We increased it uh, uh, by more than has been done in the last 15 to 18 years. That's because it had been pretty stagnant over the last six years. We made it, gave it a pretty major boost of about $1,000 over the next two years. So it's about a, from a $4,300 grant to about a $5,300 grant. Uh, for, for those who are going to college. Still not enough given the cost of education, but it's a lot more, plus with the reduction in the interest rate for student loans, that, that adds up to a substantial amount. By the way, we did that without having to raise taxes or cut other programs. We did that by simply telling the banks that give out those student loans that they'd get less of a, mar a profitable return on getting those, on, on those loans to students. Because remember, all those student loans are guaranteed. Who guarantees them? The federal government, you and I, through our taxpayer dollars. So these banks are making loans that are risk-free because they know if a student defaults, guess what? You and I pick up the tab. And they were making quite a differential in profits off of what they charge in interest and what they paid for the money that they allowed out to borrow. So we just simply cut back how much their return would be on each loan that they let out. And that's the money, that was, so it was enough money that we could increase the size of a student grant by more than $1,000 and cut the interest rate for student loans by, by half. So there are ways to do this, these things creatively. Uh, we are trying to figure out how we get a bill to increase, uh, to provide health care to the 9 million or so children, actually there's close to 11 million children in this country have no health insurance. And most of them are, are living in homes with working, working parents. It's just that the parents can't afford health care. And we're trying to figure out how we get that uh, health care to those kids. We're going to try to do it through what's called the S-CHIP program, which you've probably heard about, the state health insurance program, which here is called Healthy Families in California. That's going to cost us about 35 to $50 billion. The way we pay for that, because by the way, this Congress this year said no more just adding to the deficit. Anything we do that costs money, we will find a way to pay for Either we're going to increase taxes, we're going to cut programs. But we, won't, we will not add to the size of the massive deficits that, that we have. And the way we pay for that is by increasing the tax on tobacco. And so those of you who smoke, you'll probably pay more for your cigarettes. But we have to figure out a way to pay for health care for kids. And this is, uh, if we get to 50 billion, we get to almost all 11, 11 million kids. If we have to cut it back to what the Senate did at 35 billion, we get to about 7 million kids. We're hoping to get to the higher number, but it all depends on whether we have the money to do it. Um, energy bill, we're trying to get an ener a couple of energy bills passed. We're trying to raise the CAFE standards. Those are the, the, the fuel mileage standards for vehicles. That's a regional political problem we have, not a, so much a partisan problem. The folks out in Detroit, obviously, where the auto companies are, those auto companies are ex exerting a lot of pressure on members of Congress to not support a fixed increase to 35 miles per gallon on average for their fleet of vehicles from the 28 miles per gallon we have now. By the way, in Europe, the average uh, for their fleet vehicles is about two miles a gallon now. And, the, and their European auto companies voluntarily agreed to, to go to that standard. Japan, it's about 45 miles per gallon. We're hoping that by 2018 or so, we can get to 35 miles per gallon. And we're having trouble getting there. <laughs> Secondly, we, another component of this energy bill is to try to take billions of dollars that right now oil companies and coal-producing coal companies are getting in royalties and profits go into alternative energy fuels to help industries and companies that are willing to invest in solar, wind, tidal, all the different alternative energies that are out there that are far cleaner and renewable. That, that's a big issue because you've got the guys in Texas and Louisiana that are very big on oil and gas who are very much against it. Just like the automakers are, are really pushing some of the Midwest members of Congress and senators to not support the change, you've got the, the, in, the special interests in Texas and Louisiana and some of these states that are very uh, energy producing really exerting a lot of pressure so that Congress will not move towards taking some of that money away uh, from the oil and gas industry and coal industry and put it into alternative energies. So those are the things that we're trying to get through. 
Lots more on the agenda that I could tell you about, the education bill, the No Child Left Behind bill, which we're trying to re rework because it hasn't worked in so many ways. A lot more, but let me stop there and devote the rest of the time to, to you all to ask questions, make comments,